Welcome to After the Oil Machine. The issues raised in the film The Oil Machine have become even more urgent in recent months, with dramatic upheavals in energy security, the cost of living and our climate. A year on from the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow, we're going back to the film's contributors to ask them how recent global events have shaped the ongoing debate about oil. I'm Rachel Kaplan, Outreach Coordinator for the film, and I'm delighted to be joined here today by Jake Malloy, an Aberdeen-based regional organiser of the Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers Union, who represents offshore energy workers. Jake has worked in the oil industry for over 40 years and is a champion for the contribution that his members have made to undertaking the vast and dangerous work of building and maintaining the infrastructure that underpins the oil machine. In the past few months, there have been record profits for oil companies, while our energy costs continue to soar higher and higher. What's the, the current mood amongst the unions and the oil workers? Yeah, one of dissatisfaction, I think, is about as kind I can be in terms of summing it up. You know, this is a workforce which has been has been under tremendous pressures to reduce cost, cut costs. They've seen their work-life balance um, adjusted quite significantly with the the implementation of three-week working offshore, which is absolutely hated universally. Um, they've had pay cuts, they've had terms and conditions eroded, they've become a very a very um, precarious group now for, for a lot of workers. And all of that was as a consequence of the downturn, the downturn where oil prices crashed late 2014, early 15. But it's continued through and now, when we see these unbelievable profits, these record profits, profits never seen for decades, the oil companies are reluctant to, to give anything back. So that's causing a great deal of frustration and anger. And virtually every day now, we're seeing another group of workers um, move towards a grievance process and, and subsequently a um, a process for strike action. Um, something that we would all want to avoid, but the intransigence and sadly of the of the oil companies uh, means that it looks ever more likely we're looking at probably a national strike across the oil, oil and gas sector. We um, know that the oil industry is changing ma massively. Um, we no doubt past peak oil. We know Scotland's now producing so much renewable energy uh, this year already, 30% more than this time last year. And at the recent SNP conference in Aberdeen, there was a large focus on the just transition. Nicola Sturgeon made clear in her closing speech that the government has a duty to support oil and gas workers into new green jobs, which is all very well, but at the same time, Westminster's pushing out over 100 new North Sea oil and gas licenses. So two very different paths ahead. What does this mean for oil workers and what does it mean for people transitioning, uh, the just transition? Well, I think, I think you've, you've captured everything that's, that's wrong and, and what it means. What's happened is the whole issue has become a, a politicised debate. It's Westminster playing off against uh, Holyrood and Holyrood pushing back and the workers are caught up in the middle. What we, we really need is clearly defined pathways and moreover a, an, an energy plan. One that ensures that we manage the transition and that we sustain security of supply, whether that be 80% of homes heated by gas at this moment in time, working through that to, to transfer them over, whether it be hydrogen, whether it be um, air source heat pumps, whatever it may be, but we must do that transition. But instead of that, we're seeing this political football kicked the length and breadth of the country. And at the same time, the major corporations 
going ahead and doing as they please by installing huge wind farms. Wind farms, you know, biggest wind farm on the planet has currently been built off the east coast of, of England. And, uh, and there's another one coming here just off the coast of, of, of Angus in Scotland. And all of that's going ahead for the benefit of no one other than those corporations and, and shareholders and big profits. You know, we, we, need, we need a fundamental change in what we're doing if we're genuinely going to enable and facilitate a transition. And to do that, we need political will. And sadly, we don't have that political will at this moment in time. All we have is political strife, and the people that are going to suffer as a consequence are the people of, of the UK, as the other crisis, the cost of living crisis and, and the energy prices continue to escalate. They won't be adjusted if we don't take control and manage and influence what's going on. And it's just not that. So what, what are the changes that you'd like to see from government that would allow the oil workers to make these moves into clean energy and green jobs? I think the, the most important um, would be some degree of influence. I know that there's always pushback um, when trade unionists especially mention nationalisation. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a dirty word in, in some quarters, but whether it be nationalisation or a control, a controlling share, um, I'll leave that to, to the politicians to decide. But, but for the benefit of the country, for the bankers, we need that control, that managed control, so that a transition can actually occur. You know, if you look at what happened with coal miners and, and miners across the UK, they stopped and closed the bits, stopped buying and closed the bits overnight. Thousands out of jobs, millions on, on benefits. And they went this crazy dash for gas. And it was, there was a lack of control. If you compare that to, to Norway, where it's been managed, it's been licensed, it's been regulated, it's been controlled, and they have a state-owned energy company. The, the difference is, is literally night and day. Um, that's what we need primarily. And, and on the back of that then, we need support to train, to educate, to allow workers to move into the sector, to, to see it as a, as a future, a managed, controlled future which has stages, life stages, to enable them to move from one to the other and subsequently sustain the future. It's, it's having a plan, a plan which was torn up by Mrs. Thatcher in the early 80s, and no plan has existed ever since. It's left to the markets. We need a, we need a major change. We cannot, cannot work and exploit energy resource if it's left to the markets the way it is. You mentioned that some new industrial actions have been planned and changing Changing track a little bit, our new Home Secretary has just unveiled plans to give the state and the police new powers to clamp down on climate activism and strike action. Um, is it fair to connect both those types of action at this moment? No, no it isn't. And it's sad that, you know, we're now seeing the real colour of this government in terms of what their actual plans are for the state. No, th this is not, it's got nothing to do with supporting the people or, or you know, levelling up, as, as Boris used to call it. Um, this is about making as much money for that small group as they possibly can in the shortest time possible and selling off everything. This is, this is like, it's like Mrs. Thatcher, who I lived offshore with and worked through her, her period. It's like, it's like Mrs. Thatcher on steroids. It's scary what is going on. And every person in this country should be frightened by the direction in which we are moving in terms of controls and freedom. 
freedom of speech and 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 you know the, the shackles that they're trying to put on people today is wrong. I mean, I, I don't necessarily support the idea of throwing tins of soup on on artwork or, or gluing yourself to roads and blocking roads. I think there's better ways, but they're entitled to their opinion. They're entitled to demonstrate. They're entitled to freedom of speech. Justice trade unions are entitled under basic human rights to organise and withdraw their labour when they feel that they're being oppressed and that, that's what's happened. It does seem that with some of the more dramatic stunts we've seen from climate protesters recently um, that often the infrastructure of the oil machine is targeted but are there ways that we can work together uh, that, the, that the groups can work together um, I did note that um, there was a recent Enough is Enough mass day of action in London on the 1st of October and that Mick Lynch, Secretary General of RMT, stood alongside Extinction Rebellion and at this moment uh, climate activists and union leaders came together. Do you think there are ways we can work together? I think we must. We, we are the, the conduit to society at large. You know, we, we as, as different groups, different factions, are nevertheless the the means by which society, either as, as trade union activists or as climate activists, um, it's it's how we draw in that information, how we use it, how we work collaboratively that that's key to this. Because we need to inform wider society, we need to inform the world, because we we can deliver in the UK. We can be the model against which different regions of the world can, can benchmark against us on how to do a proper structured planned transition and how society and how people of the states which have access to these natural resources, whether it be oil and gas, wind, hydrogen, whatever it may be, can exploit it for the benefit of the people of the state rather than that tiny group of rich people who are earning more and more on the backs of an oppressed society. A society which now, especially here in the UK and, and probably other regions of, of, of the world at this point in time, will face a winter where we, we could be struggling with the whole question of heat or heat and whether where we're going to see pensioners die, die in their homes due to the cold and, and, and the price of electricity which we're generating just five miles off the shore here, with the wind blowing. There's something seriously wrong that we as a state, a nation, um, are looking at that as, a, as the winter ahead. It's Something's got to change. Do you think there's widespread public awareness of a just transition uh, and support for it? And if not, what can workers and trade unions do to help change that? No, I don't think there's nearly enough um, structured, informed debate about the whole thing. As I said earlier, I think it's become a political football and it's been used for political ends and political ideology rather than an informed debate and structure and, and the sharing of that information with the public. You know, the, a lot of the public are frightened, you know, when you say we're going to turn your gas off and you're going to have to pay thousands of pounds for heat pumps, that, that automatically puts them in a difficult position and they're, they're, going to, they're going to adopt what suits their needs, what suits their, their purse. And that, that's wrong. We, we, you know, we, I'm old enough to remember how we, we changed once before. We went from what we used to call town gas, gas which was manufactured by and large from, from coal, and we moved to natural gas. So you could argue that we were actually decarbonising to some, to some extent. But it was done in a methodical, structured way in which to change the whole country over to this new phenomenon of, of natural gas. We can do that and we can fund it by using the profits being made by these companies out here 
to, to make it happen. And we can put the nation at ease about what the future actually holds in terms of moving over to, to a decarbonised electric world rather than, than gas heated or oil heated burners. You know, they're frightened and they're ill informed. We need, as trade unions, as, as climate activists, to work collaboratively to address that, that gap in, in the information because the politicians, quite frankly, just aren't going to do it. They're only interested in their own ends. What can we do to support the workers in the months ahead this winter? I think the easiest fix, one which, one which I've sadly been talking about now for seven years and more, is the whole training transition. Uh, enabling workers to move into the, the renewable sector. You know, I, again, it's an illustration of that whole corporate, you know, commercial aspect of energy production, which is dictating that workers who are in precarious work, don't know when they're going to get work, where they're going to get work, how long that work is going to last, are having to use their hard-earned coin to go out and train themselves in what is essentially duplicated training to enable them to go into to renewables. It's, it's in the North Sea where we've been working for 40 years. It's using the same equipment, it's using virtually the same means of transportation, whether it be helicopters or boats. It's doing virtually the same work. First aid in wind is the same as first aid, as far as I'm aware, in oil and gas. Why do they need to go and spend thousands upon thousands of pounds to do more training when it's completely pointless? And that's just a tiny example of, of that whole capital piece, which is undermining everything that we talk about in terms of just transition. There's nothing just about having to spend your own money to do training to serve the needs of a corporate body. Um, and make more money for them. No. Thank you, Jake Malloy, for joining us today. And The Oil Machine is now showing in cinemas across the UK, and you can also contact us about hosting a community screening for your organisation, your business, or your group, wherever you are. Find out more at theoilmachine.org.